I'm not sure how many people in this room knew that IVF was a Manchester first, but it was. And it's not very often that a city, let alone a provincial city such as ours, can claim two Nobel Prizes in one year, with one of them going to uh, a, a son of the city. And that's why you're looking at a wall uh, full of babies, because let's remember, every test tube baby is therefore a Manchester baby. Um, but I think the message in that was not just about scientific excellence and, and, uh, and the pioneering work that was done in Oldham. It's about the partnership that drives innovation and scientific endeavour to produce real results. And that's very much what I think we're going to explore in the next few minutes. And to start that, I'm going to hand over to Chris Oglesby, who's the chief executive of, of one of Manchester's most established names in, in the development sector. And he's going to tell us, among other things, about how Bruntwood is starting to do some very exciting uh, uh, work in exactly the space of science and technology. Chris. Thank, thanks for that, Mike. Um, I think pro probably in, in, in the next five minutes or so when I'm talking, there is going to be a little bit of repetition on some of the messages that you've had over the last 24 hours. I, I make no apologies for that. Um, Jim O'Neill was very clear yesterday lunchtime when he talked about the future of cities like Manchester, and uh, it is us identifying those things that we can do that are genuinely world class and really uh, and really focusing on them. And uh, the, uh, the, the the knowledge sector is is, is one of those things. Um, it's something that we've always been uh, been good at. We look back at our history and we talk about ourselves as a trading city, and we were a great trading city. But interestingly. Um, we were a great trading city because of the innovation um, in the first place, the things that we were developing uh, at the time. Um, there's probably no better example of the city's uh, original modern brand than the, uh, the knowledge sector. It helps that um, the brand of the corridor that we're particularly focusing on and, uh, and the original modern brand were both developed by, by Peter Savile. But more importantly, the corridor is the place where all the city's historic scientific achievements uh, meet its modern scientific ambition. Just quickly um, run through a few 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 examples. Um, John Dalton's first uh, atomic theory, sorry, John Dalton's atomic theory was a forerunner of all modern medicine developed in Manchester. John Benjamin Dancer invented microphotography and microfilms in Manchester. Uh, that's the example of one of the early pictures. Uh, this next thing um, is a uh, is actually a submarine. Um, you wouldn't know it, but uh, in fact, the first mechanically powered submarine was launched to the designs of uh, the Reverend George Garrett in Manchester. Um, Rutherford, moving on into the 20th century, Ernest Rutherford discovered how to split the atom in 1919 in Manchester. And, uh, and a baby, um, we still maintain that the first computer with stored program memory was born uh, in Manchester. And bringing us bang up to date, uh, my exclusive announcement, uh, do, I don't know if any of you know, but uh, we uh, got a couple of uh, Nobel Prize winners, our two, two Russians for, uh, for, for, for graphene. What you may not uh, be aware of is those two Russians are in very good company and that over the years, Manchester University has 25 Nobel laureates amongst its past and present staff. 22 of these are uh, awarded for science or medicine. Uh, Alan Gilbert recognised the importance of this when he uh, took on the job at, uh, as Vice-Chancellor of the University and saw the importance to the city of really catapulting Manchester University into the Premier League of, uh, of World Universities. And Nancy Rothwell, um, post, uh, po post um, Alan's very sad demise, has now taken, has now taken that on. Manchester is also recognised as being a member of the European Super League of Biotech Clusters by, uh, by Stratagem and is the world's top 50 biomedical locations by, uh, by Boston Consulting. Manchester has particular strengths in oncology, regenerative medicine. Manchester is already the UK exemplar city region for clinical trials and the development of medical devices. And it's not just Manchester University driving the knowledge agenda. Despite the cuts, MMU are pressing ahead with their £110 million Burley Fields campus designed by Shepard Robson, which not only creates a centre of academic excellence, but also it critically integrates the campus with the community and reduces its carbon footprint by 60%. Outside of the corridor, in Stockport, there is the world's largest biobank, a particularly pleasant use. Um, it contains blood, urine and saliva samples from over half a million volunteers to be used to improve the prevention um, and diagnosis and treatment of a wide range of illnesses. There are already 280 core biomedical companies located in the Greater Manchester region, including Icon, Gempro, Bronovo, Epistem in Manchester, to name but a few. The University of Manchester is the largest single-site university in the UK, and half its research budget is for life sciences and medicine. 
as well as Manchester University, Manchester Metropolitan University, the city can also boast the Biomedical Research Centre, the Core Technology Facility, the Dalton Nuclear Institute, and Manchester Science Park. Also, we've got large, Europe's largest cancer centre at Christie's as well. And uh, the Central Manchester University Hospital and H Trust is Europe's biggest academic and biggest clinical campus and includes Europe's largest single-site paediatric hospital, the uh, Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. If you haven't been around the building yet, you really must. It's a fantastic facility. Uh, with Ensure, the University Hospital South Manchester has 400 research projects on with the university and are world experts on all matters associated with the heart and lungs. And scientists based at the hospital have recently discovered a genetic link between uh, children and asthma. Manchester University School of Pharmacy is one of the UK's leading centres of pharmacy research with 95% of all its work clusters internationally significant. In addition to the biomedical companies I've also mentioned in Manchester and its region, it's also the host home for uh, numerous pharmaceutical and medical device companies, um, all of those uh, logos there. All of them are here because of the universities, the hospitals, the exceptional clinicians and academics, the deep talent pool, the connectivity of a world-leading airport and the quality of life that Manchester has to offer. Oh, and in the case of the, uh, the Nobel Prize winners, a passion that city have for, the, the city has for football as well, which uh, they share with us. So against this very impressive backdrop of, uh, of science, um, it's easy to understand why we, Brumpwood, have taken a real interest in creating space for the Manchester science sector. As well as expanding our core CBD office product into other regional cities and expanding it within our existing cities of Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool and Birmingham, we're also looking to diversify into the knowledge economy in our core Manchester city centre marketplace. We see this very much as the next marketplace um, for, uh, for, for, for Brumpwood. And um, we're aiming to grow another concentrated portfolio in the location with a business focused on creating places for the city's knowledge economy to flourish. Whilst we see this activity spanning the wider city region as well, initially our focus is very much on, uh, on, on the corridor, as is the, uh, as is the cities. And this has presented us with the opportunity to expand our product offer into what will be, what we believe, the next significant area of growth for the city over the next 20 years. The Oxford Road Corridor, as, as, as highlighted up there, um, aims to be a centre of excellence for learning, healthcare, science, ICT and digital media. It's already, as I mentioned, the Europe's largest clinical and academic campus, New public transport, new public rail, next generation fibre broadband are all being rolled out along the corridor. The strategy is another great example of how well Manchester works in partnership. The city recognised the potential of this cluster of knowledge assets on Oxford Road four years ago and was instrumental in setting up the Oxford Road partnership, which in time became the corridor following its rebound. Under the leadership of Alan Gilbert initially and latterly John Brooks, ourselves Brumwood with the city, the universities, the hospitals and the science park have developed a clear strategy for the area incorporating all aspects of major placemaking improvements that could only come about as a result of coordinated efforts between like-minded individuals and organisations. Strategies for delivering space to meet occupier demand, funding transport, public realm, fibre, power, community integration, marketing and positioning have all been developed. And it's only when you go to other places outside of Manchester and try and achieve the same thing that you realise just how incredible the achievements of these local area partnerships have been in bringing together what are a load of different co competing forces for the common good of the, uh, of the city. And it's a credit to the value of the corridor partnership and the, and the value that it's delivering that despite the cuts, it will survive to, to continue to deliver its strategic vision. One very clear, significant um, example of this is the former Royal Eye Hospital, which we're delivering in partnership with landowner Central Manchester University Healthcare Trust, sector specialist the Manchester Science Park, with significant input from other corridor partners, the City and Manchester University. The scheme which encapsulates um, Bromwood's track record in both de developing and managing buildings, it's not just about the building, it's about creating a place and a community that will allow a wide range of knowledge-based businesses to flourish. The, business, the building will be a commercially viable centre of excellence for the biomedical sector, and the 100,000 square foot site will be a catalyst for the expansion of innovative private sector value-add buildings who until now have had nowhere in the city to grow. The £21 million development is a mix of old and new, original and modern, brought together by retaining the listed Victorian facade and constructing a new glass atrium to join the old with the new. The site has a unique presence on Oxford Road in that it's actually on the clinical campus, making it an ideal location for R&D and clinical trials, which increasingly have to be on hospital campus. It will also be a major catalyst for kicking off our corridor activities. 
Just like our core business, we see our corridor business growing by working in partnership with the city and other partners. Unlike our core CBD office business though, we see many of these partnerships being in a more formal way. Given the very capital intensive nature of schemes such as the eye hospital, we will be looking for equity partners to work with in our development along the uh, corridor. In addition, our partnership with the MSP on the eye hospital also illustrates our desire to better understand and service the science occupiers by working with sector specialists. Uh, and, uh, and also, our choice of professional team on the eye hospital shows that we also want to be working with partner professionals and contractors with the science sector expertise as well. So, all in all, uh, the corridor presents a great opportunity for Manchester to do what it does best, to deliver world-class urban redevelopment through a multi-dimensional partnership that truly reflects the city's brand position as the original modern city. As well as creating space for the knowledge businesses to flourish, there's just one other area I'd quickly like to cover where I think our sector, the property industry, can particularly help drive Manchester as a science powerhouse, and that's in the area of environmental innovation. Um, the environment is an issue that plays directly into Manchester's strengths. It's an original modern problem, it's the original modern problem, requiring an original modern solution. It is yet another issue where only by working in partnership with our customers, suppliers and city, as well as engaging and motivating employees can we effectively minimise our environmental impact. This has long been embedded in the way that Brontwood does business, from our instinct um, for recycling buildings due to our natural history of waste, the principles of sustainability are a logical fit with our long-term perspective and commitment to the cities we operate in. Um, I've got my slides a bit out of order here, so apologies, they don't, they don't particularly match with what I'm saying. Anyway, um, this complements the work we're funding to the tune of about a million pounds with the city and the University of Manchester on a project called EcoCities, which is close to creating a blueprint for how best to adapt cities and buildings to climate change. Based on robust academic research, it will be a practical plan produce commercially realisable outcomes as well as wider benefits to the economy. On a more micro stage, as well as developing exemplar new buildings such as One New York Street, which was the first new build in Manchester to achieve the new Briam Excellent Post Build Rating, working with Arup, we're also looking at some, a couple of our existing estates where uh, we've got multi-occupied buildings working around the occupiers to see how we can uh, improve through retrofitting the performance of the, uh, the buildings. With 80% of buildings that uh, will be occupied in 2050 currently occupied today, retrofitting is a very important uh, part to the future of our, our cities, which is a really good place for me to hand over now. Um, Bromwood are already working in partnership uh, with Siemens uh, to push the science agenda in Manchester, and particularly we're already talking together about the sustainability agenda and new ways of approaching, to building, approaching building retrofits. We're fortunate in Manchester to have such a world-class organisation as Siemens. I say fortunate, um, but it's no accident that they're in the, uh, the city. Siemens are another legacy of Manchester's great innovative history. But rather than me try and tell you more about that, I'll hand over to, uh, to Robin Phillips, who, uh, who will. And I'd say apologies, the, uh, we lost it at the end. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Just building on what Chris... Uh, Chris is leading there. What I'd like to do is just kind of cover uh, Siemens' contribution to the sustainability of the city of Manchester. But before I do that, I'd like to kind of try and shatter a couple of myths about Siemens. You can see up here an elderly gentleman, uh, William, Sir William Siemens. He came over in uh, 1843 to the UK, age 19, and then built the company to 10,000 strong by 1900. And that time, he was very much involved in improving the quality of, of urban life during the second half of the 19th century and also very much involved in connecting cities together on a global scale. Also, you can see from here, he's keen on green, so green energy solutions as well, in terms of the example of the electric, first electric train at Bushmills, taking the whiskey to the port at, uh, at, uh, at Port Rush in Northern Ireland. So very much an innovator in his time, and really living the, the principles of innovation and how they can improve the quality, of, or could improve the quality of life at the turn of the first century very much the, the, the application of science to improve the life, the quality of life in those days. How things changed within our company since then. By the way, 10,000 strong at, uh, at the turn of the century. Had we not had our two political hiccups in 1914 and 1939, we could actually be the global headquarters of Siemens worldwide in the UK if we carried on on that kind of growth, growth path that was uh, 
uh, evident in the first, second half of the, uh, the 19th century. Anyway, how is it today? Well, in principle, not much different, no change. We're really still heavily uh, investing significant amounts of our turnover, our global turnover in research and development, so just over 5% there. The size of the company has changed somewhat from 10,000 at the turn of the century to 405,000 people worldwide. You can see there down the bottom, significant amounts of inventions in the financial year uh, 2010 just gone, so 40 invention disclosures per working day. So seriously, a, a serious powerhouse of innovation uh, across all sectors in terms of medical, in terms of energy, in terms of uh, infrastructure and transport. At the local level, oh, sorry, no, before I move on to the local level, a significant part of our portfolio, our global portfolio, is also related to green and the environmental uh, issues. So you can see there, 28 billion of our, our global turnover, global turnover about, well, about 76 billion, is related to green and environmental issues. So a significant contributor to sustainability of the planet using technology. Taking it down to a, a more local level now, building on what, uh, what Chris was saying earlier, these are the types of touch points that we have within your standard building. So really going around the picture, you can see almost everything to do with power electricity around the building improving the uh, eff effectiveness and efficiency of a building is very much our, our bread and butter. And you can see there also, we, we've also practiced what we preach, so the Carbon Trust there, the Carbon Trust Standard, we also have quite a large portfolio of properties within the Siemens organization in the UK. As far as the industry sector is concerned that I'm responsible for, we have 57 locations around the UK. So we do like to practice what we preach and we've got the standard there from the Carbon Trust to, to confirm that. And incidentally, I'll just use the opportunity to announce that we've also just agreed with the Carbon Trust a, a funding program to support uh, energy efficient projects to the tune of £550 million to basically encourage small to medium sized enterprises to invest in energy saving opportunities funded by Siemens through the Carbon Trust. So that's looking at, uh, at our contribution at the city level, at uh, the building level, sorry. Let's, uh, in terms of the city level, just some of the touch points as we, as we broaden it out there. So we're looking at quite a, a significant contribution in terms of energy metering, for example, uh, traffic solutions, energy from waste, just to pick a few examples, green manufacturing and e-car technology. So a significant uh, contribution to the uh, city infrastructure as well. And this is just looking at, at our industry sector. There's a further uh, contribution coming in also from our, from our energy sector. How do we see the near future developing within Siemens? Well, really, we're looking at particularly smart buildings in smart grids in smart cities. So we have an intelligent grid, dynamic price monitoring, where we're consuming and charging our electric car, ideally a Tesla, during low tariff periods. And then during the high tariff periods, we're then consuming that electricity that we've actually uh, generated and saved during those, uh, those low, low cost uh, tariff periods. So this is how we see the development going forward. And there again, we have our e-car being charged up overnight, ready for the next day. Now to be able to do that, we've, there's quite a lot of challenges. Sorry, clicker's not working. Right, yeah. But to, to be able to deliver what we just showed in that brief animation, there's quite a lot of things to consider. As the demand goes up for offshore generation, the offshore wind farms are going further and further offshore. And that brings with it te technical challenges. You see there on the graph, hopefully from the back, the, the kind of power drop off uh, the further you go offshore. So what we need to do is create uh, collection stations. You can see this on the right hand side here down the bottom collection stations which consolidate a group of uh, wind, wind generators offshore, bring it together on a platform and then ship that into, into the shore. So this is what we're working on now within Manchester. And to that end, we're actually investing now, we've just started to cut the soil on our site on the Princess, corner of Princess Road and uh, Bollamore Road there. So we're, we're, we're building a renewable energy centre in fact, we call it the Renewable Energy Engineering Centre. We're trying to think of a more snazzy name for it. But uh, this is a, a global hub 
one of three worldwide. And uh, it's a real statement that our company, our global company, has said, right, we're going to uh, locate this in the UK and particularly in Manchester. And the, the guys here are specializing in what I've just talked about in bringing that offshore generated power onshore safely. So uh, we see over the left hand side there down the bottom, uh, there's a technology transfer going to be taking place between our headquarters as we pass the expertise and knowledge across to the UK. And simultaneously, we're going to be ramping up the uh, engineers and the project managers in the, the new location in Manchester. Very, very fast track. This is due to be finished by this December of this year. So it's a very, very ambitious plan. And we're, we're fully behind it and we're very, very confident and very, very pleased that this is happening. So finally, why, why Manchester? Why are we here? And it is no, it is no, uh, no ch chance that we're here. It is actually a part of uh, the history of Manchester, why we're here. First of all, uh, a successful team in Manchester. It's a successful business, and that's recognized by our headquarters, so they have the confidence to invest. Then the proximity to our world-beating network of universities and further education, higher education establishments that we've got in the Manchester area and in the Northwest. Then there's a the language. The English language is particularly useful for our business globally. But Manchester also has some specific advantages here because we have multiple languages in Manchester through our diverse population within the Manchester area. The fourth thing I'd like to mention, uh, which is also a, a real critical decision factor in a location of a business like this on a global basis, is, to, is having a very, very business orientated and decisive public sector locally, specifically the council. Those, those are all the things that have contributed to our location of this global center of excellence in Manchester. And you can see, uh, we can't necessarily see, but the, the actual position of this building is going to be up, up in, a, in the left-hand corner here, bottom left-hand corner. And as you can see, we've got a lot of space there, so we've got a lot of space to expand and grow this technology ex excellence center within the Manchester area. So really, that was a very quick overview of Siemens' contribution to sustainability in Manchester. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, when they um, they asked me if I'd round this off this morning, um, and my first response was, um, well, not really. Uh, um, uh, why me? Um, but. Realizing that, that Chris and, and Robin would go into to detail, um, I thought I could perhaps just say something about this in the, in the broader context. And um, I, I usually have something to say about broader context. Um, to me, th this, this is all about how Manchester is known and will be known in the future, which is my understanding of, of what a brand is. And um, yesterday, over at the Majestic, for those of you who were there, um, there was a, a remarkable kind of new economic landscape illustrated, particularly by, by Jim O'Neill. Um, and, and it seemed to me that it didn't really get touched upon, um, but it was briefly mentioned. It, it seemed to me that in that new economic landscape, um, the brand of a place, I, what it was known for, was going to be key and, and kind of paramount to, to competitiveness um, and possibly even to, to the kind of viability of a place. Um, as you know, I believe Manchester should be known as a modern city. Um, a modern city of the 21st century in the, in the way that it was the modern city of the 19th. Um, and a signifier of modernity, obviously, is ideas. And the, the knowledge infrastructure in Manchester is nurturing intelligence and it's generating ideas. In fact, there were over 300 invention disclosures filed by Manchester University last year. And an, and an invention disclosure is the first step towards a patent. Um, but my question is, is who, who develops these ideas? Um, and, and, and how this kind of culture of intelligence can, can shape the future of the city. 
Um, Howard spoke yesterday about strong relationships between the universities and the cities. And, and I'm kind of beginning to wonder now whether some kind of forum of opportunity, some kind of open forum of, of connectivity should, um, should perhaps develop. Um, in the dot-com boom, there were days referred to as First Tuesdays, where investors and ideas um, kind of got together and tried to make connections. And um, the, the, the raw material of the innovation that, that Mike has been talking about is an asset that Manchester has. And um, the challenge really for the city and the region is how, to kind of, how it's going to capitalize uh, upon that. Um, and if Manchester is going to take care of itself, and I'm not exactly sure who else is, if Manchester itself doesn't do it, then um, um, it is going to have to drive its own economy. And it's individuals with ideas that make occupations for others. And um, the, the sort of service-dominated thinking of the last 30 years, uh, I have to say, never made complete sense to me um, in the UK. And, um, and it doesn't seem to make doesn't seem to make sense to other people now either. Um, and, and so therefore, you know, it's quite obvious that we need people doing things. And innovation is the way to be doing um, things um, uh, that, that are premium, premium activities. And um, it's those that have um, added value and it's those that can support actually meaningful jobs for people. Um, it, it seems that it's possible that um, Manchester can be a place of modern opportunity in the world going forward, and I think that's obviously um, an opportunity the city has to grasp. So, thank you.